Here's our what the physics video. This one is on, uh, well, we're pretty much doing example problems dealing with the period of a spring and uh, also for a pendulum. <clears throat> so we knew that uh, Hooke's Law had this. Okay. We, we've got the negative K times X is equal to the force. And we know that force is equal to the mass times acceleration. So I can just kind of rearrange these and then do some trig stuff that was kind of overwhelming for me. Um, and I didn't really see the point in showing it on the board. But we get this. Okay, we get T squared is equal to 4 pi squared times mass divided by K. That little K is the spring constant K. Please be very careful when it comes to the spring constant K versus the kinetic energy K. Rearranging, or I'm sorry, uh, just taking the square root of both sides, we get the equation for period. I can then rearrange that for frequency and get this. Just depends on what you're looking for. Or you could just solve for the period and then invert it, whatever you'd like. Okay, so important things to take away. We already know that the uh, for a for a pendulum, we don't care about the mass. Okay, and it's dependent upon length. For the pendulum, it's dependent upon length. This is not exact opposite, but it's, it kind of is. In the case of a spring, we do care about the mass, and we don't care about the length, or more specifically, the amount of stretch, because that won't affect the period. So here we have a vibrating chair. It's one of those one of those bouncy ones. Have you ever seen a kid in this? Okay, so uh, you design a bouncy seat for someone. You got a bungee cord up here. You got the mass here. That's 12 kilograms. It's going to bounce at this frequency. Calculate the K value for the bungee cord. And then what would happen to the frequency if you doubled the total mass? Okay, so please be working on that. Okay, so if we list out our variables, oh, here we are. Got my frequency, I got my mass, I'm looking for my K. I'm going to use the equation we just had on the previous slide. I've got this is my frequency. Well, that's solved for frequency. I, I don't want it solved for frequency, I want it solved for K. So k is in the square root, so i got to square both sides and then start shuffling things around, yeah? Okay. Solving for k, I should have this, right? Okay. And <clears throat> because we're not going to be changed, we, we, uh, I just kind of put all this stuff to the side here. We'll see why I, I separate off variables in just a few moments. Okay, but I plug in my frequency, 0.4 squared, I plug in my mass, that was the 12, the 4, the pi squared, okay. So I get my K value as this, uh, 75.80 kilograms per second squared, or you can say newtons per meter if, if you uh, want the more standardized units. Okay, so with only two sig figs, uh, well, I guess that should have been 76. Well, whatever. Okay. Then part B. What would happen to the frequency if I double the total mass? So if I double the mass, am I going to change the K value? No. So I can, just, I can just keep that K value now that I have it, and I can plug in back to the equation. Or, and this is what I was trying to get at by separating out all the constants, if I can just say, hey, looking at, um, well, this, we said my k isn't going to change. The 4 and the pi squared, those aren't going to change either. So if I can just say, oh, what happens when I double this value? What happens uh, to, the, to the frequency? I got frequency is proportional to 1 or to the square root of 1 over m. Or you can say 1 over square root of m, same thing. 
Okay. So if I'm putting a 2 in front of the mass, that means I've got to put a 2 on the other side of the equation as well. But that 2 is inside of square root, and it's in the denominator. So it's really like I'm saying f, the frequency, divided by the square root of 2. Or divide by 1.414. So I got this. Okay? Whether you got it by working through the entire equation or just focusing on proportionalities, great. But remember, the AP exam, you don't have to have a calculator. So make sure you understand the proportional stuff. Okay? Great. Let's continue on. Energy and simple harmonic motion. We already talked about a bunch of stuff. This is really just a review. This is culminating stuff. Okay? If, um, if I've got this motion going back and forth, back and forth, if at time zero my displacement is A, so this is time zero, then my elastic potential energy is this. It's my just, you know, one half kx squared, right? So in this case, x is k. So one half k a squared. My kinetic is zero, so my total uh, energy, oh, that should say e total, not u total. That's irritating. Hmm. Oh, well, fix that on your papers, please. This should say the total e. Um, anyhow, is this. At a quarter of the period, I'm going to be over here. Remember, a period is a full oscillation. So this is half the period, and then this is the second half. So a quarter of it, I'm going to be right here. So that's when my kinetic is maximum and my elastic is zero. Okay, so that's zero and my kinetic is maximum. So once again, the E total, not U total, is just one-half M times V max squared. Okay, my displacement at one half t is going to be negative a. So go ahead and fill in the rest, please. The symmetry will help, by the way. Okay, so hopefully you got this filled in. It's on the next slide. <clears throat> hopefully I got it filled in properly, too. Uh, so right here at half the period, it's going to be all kinetic. And the, um, let's see, the kinetic, I'm sorry, excuse me. It's going to be all elastic potential, and the kinetic is going to be zero. Okay. Just like we've said before. Okay, and then back at three-quarters T, that's right in the center. The displacement is zero, which means the elastic potential is zero. Because we can just plug in one-half K zero squared. And it's, once again, the max. Notice we don't really care about the signs. How come? Because it gets it just gets squared away, right? Okay. And um, once again, this should be saying E total, right? It's 1 half MV max squared. And then just like at time 0, okay, so that's why I was talking about with the symmetry. Okay. Good stuff. With that in mind, we can do a little bit of an extrapolation. What is the fastest the speed is going to... Uh, I'm sorry. What is the fastest uh, the cart can go at? What's the greatest speed? Okay. We already looked at the positions just a moment ago. And you'll remember it's slowest at the extreme positions when the amplitude was either positive A or negative A. We said it was all spring potential there. So imagine we're going to do a conservation of energy here. So that's going to be like our initial. And then it's going to be fastest at a zero amplitude. So when it was back at the equilibrium point. Okay, so that's going to be our, our final energy, right? There's no change in, in gravitational, there's no outside work, there's no internal energy, all that stuff. 
So we're just going to use a, a simple uh, conservation. These guys here. And we're going to say, oh, well, one half mass times uh, velocity max squared is equal to one half k a squared. Okay, some quick rearranging, in other words, get rid of the one halves and divide through by mass, gives us this. If I want the v max, I just square root both sides. The a squared, when that gets square rooted, that comes out. The k over m is going to be inside the square root. Okay. So this is just a derived equation. It's an extrapolation of what we had been doing before. Okay, but try it out. Okay, we have a, oh, that should be 10 to the 4 newtons per meter. Uh, that's our spring constant. We've got a mass, and we've got the total vibrational energy of this, 3.2. So... Figure out the amplitude, the velocity max, the speed at a particular position, and then uh, the amplitude if the energy of the system were doubled. Cool. Okay, so using conservation of mechanical energy, we can determine the amplitude of the vibration. Use the previous slide, solving for A. We get this. Determining the cart's maximum speed using that last equation before. Determining the speed when the amplitude is this. Once again, we're going to be using conservation of, of energy, but we cannot use, oh, this is zero and that's zero. We can't zero everything out. Okay? And then what would the amplitude be if the vibration... So what would be the amplitude of the vibration if the energy of the system were doubled? Okay. Ends up like this because potential energy is proportional to amplitude squared. Okay. Hopefully we can keep working. Okay, folks, make sure you are understanding these relationships here. I specifically left them in terms of variables. So that way you could say like, oh... Uh, how is the velocity related to the potential energy? How is the velocity related to the mass? And of course, pay attention to if there's squares and, and whatever else. In um, <clears throat> excuse me, in part C, we of course had to have this a little bit different. It is conservation, just like before. But as I had mentioned, we were not able to say that. Um, one of the finals was equal to zero. It says it's got this displacement, so it's got that much of the spring potential energy, and um, and then all the rest of the total energy is going to be kinetic. Moving on to the next one, we got another check yourself. This is right out of the uh, right out of the textbook. So, like I said before, you might have done this already. Uh, your textbook did not include this picture right next to it, though I thought that might be beneficial for you. You're supposed to find the period of a, a vibration of a cart on a spring. I'm sorry, excuse me. The period is 2.0 seconds. Um, and the... Uh, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm sorry. Uh, the spring uh, potential energy is fluctuating back and forth in a standard pattern, right? So what is the period of the spring potential energy variation of the system? In other words, what is the period of how long it takes to go for the spring potential energy um, from a high to a low back to a high? Okay, and that's going to be slightly different from what you might be expecting. And then what's the period T for the total energy for the system? So we'll go ahead and take a moment to work on that. <laughs> okay, so hopefully we figured this out already. The, as I mentioned, this is not the period, this period here that we're getting for part A is not the same as the overall period. The overall period here is two seconds. That says I start here, I go over here, and then I come back to here in two seconds. 
okay? And if I were to break this up, like going over here would be just one second. If I were to go this far, that would be half a second, and so on. Part A is specifically saying the spring potential variation, or how long it takes to go from one uh, spring potential energy back to that same spring potential energy. Okay, so it's actually, if you go back a few slides, going back a few slides, back a few slides, Oop, there we go, oh, too far. Here we are. If you recall, the spring potential energy is going to be maximum at here and here, here and here. Okay, so that's at zero period, half the period, and the full period. So I can now move forward back to back to this and I get it is the full period is two seconds but it's only going to take one second to go from here to here. Part B is a little bit weirder. What is the period for the total energy of the system? Well does the total energy of the system ever change? No, it doesn't. So that's kind of a bizarre one. It never changes because there's never any outside forces. Okay. The individual pieces might vary, but the total does not. So is the period infinity or zero? I don't know. Okay. Moving on. Now we're talking about the simple pendulum. We had done this before way, way, way back in the beginning of the year. And we had the masses swinging back and forth. And here's some free body diagrams for how they're moving. So as we had said with the free body diagrams, uh, it is really a combination of the tension force and the uh, gravitational force. Remember your textbook says it kind of weird. Instead of saying gravitational, it's saying earth on, on the, on the uh, I guess, ball, the, the mass. Okay, so the um, <clears throat> the force is always bringing it back in. Okay, and it's like we said, a combination of these, so that's why it's always kind of changing. Okay, and the direction is is um, is um, going along with it. Okay, just like before, we know that it has. Uh, <coughs> excuse me. It has maximums and minimums at various points. Okay, so let's go on to the next slide. But uh, right here at the highest point, we already know in terms of conservation of energy, it's not going to be moving. That's the highest point. It's not going to go up any higher. It hasn't started to fall back down yet. So that means the gravitational potential energy is maximum. And then down here, assuming it's swinging through, that would be maximum kinetic, so therefore maximum velocity. Okay, so here we have it with uh, the various diagrams. We've got the acceleration and the velocity going on. It's a little bit stranger. I mean, the velocity is pretty much the same as it was for the uh, oscillating spring. Okay. It doesn't, I don't think this image does a terribly good job at, at clarifying how the velocity is actually slowing down on its way up here and this is the maximum velocity but this is where the velocity is maximum if nothing else you can use conservation of energy to get that okay I don't think it does a stellar job at really explaining the acceleration either but you say why is it pointing upwards why is well and therefore why is the uh, force going to be upwards remember this is the centripetal stuff so in many cases it's a bit more analogous to the circular motion um, but at the extremes, we definitely recognize that the accelerations are maximum and toward the equilibrium point. Velocities are zero and toward the equilibrium point. Okay, and there's a, a slightly larger view of the forces. Right underneath, we've got the whole conservation of energy thing going on. Okay, but we already knew about that. Because as it says, we are awesome. So what affects the period of a pendulum? We already knew this from the beginning of the year. 
The mass of the bob? Nope. The angle of the displacement. As long as it's relatively small, it doesn't affect anything. And your textbook kind of talks about that in terms of the sine of theta being practically the same as theta for small angles. You don't have to worry about that, but there we go. The length of the string absolutely does affect it. Could the mass of the string affect it? Technically, yes. That's why we usually just think of the uh, pendulum bob as, as a point object with a massless string. But if this were like a rope or something, and the bob not being much heavier than the rope, that would change things because that could uh, effectively raise up the center of mass, um, which means it would definitely affect our period. Here is the equation. Okay, we Once again, we got 2 pi times the square root of, except in this case, it's length of the string divided by the gravitational field. We already knew about the whole length of the string thing, and the longer the string, the longer the period. Okay. Now, specifically, we know about the whole square root relationship, which we had not necessarily realized at the beginning of the year, but we knew it wasn't exactly proportional. There was something else involved. So there we are. So the fact that the gravitational field in which the pendulum is in is going to actually affect uh, the period of the clock is actually kind of cool because that means you can use the period of the clock and or I mean the clock the I'm thinking in terms of a grandfather clock I guess but the period of a pendulum in general I suppose we can if we have the period of the pendulum and of course we know the length of the pendulum exactly we should be able to calculate what the gravitational field is on whatever that surface is if we're on the moon if we're on a different planet um, and so on. So that's kind of cool. And not only that, but, I mean, if you had good enough equipment, and that's going to be super good, you imagine um, you were somehow able to dig a hole. So we're in northern Virginia. We dig a hole uh, several uh, hundred meters down. Okay? Is that going to affect the, gravita uh, the gravitational field enough to therefore affect the period? Okay? What if we then climbed up on a mountain? So we have some mountains nearby us. We probably want some really tall mountains, uh, maybe the Rockies, maybe uh, you know, going to Mount Everest or something. That would be a lot more significant distance. Would that be enough to affect the period? Okay. So that's just kind of cool. And, yeah, it, it, you know, technically there, there would be a difference, although would you be able to measure it? Who knows? And speaking of grandfather clocks, so a grandfather clock uh, uses a pendulum to keep time. You've probably seen this before. Uh, uh, maybe it's maybe it's the uh, uh, full like six or seven feet tall grandfather clock. Maybe it's just one that's uh, uh, more of a wall hanging one that has a pendulum a bit smaller. But anyhow, they're pretty cool to see and they have pretty chimes and and such. But it is a uh, cool example of physics. We have the pendulum being a particular length. And thus, it will. It should give a consistent period. Now, we'll talk about maybe it doesn't in a moment. Okay. Uh, some of them are set up so the pendulum swings back and forth. It takes one second, or it swings just half the period in one second, or whatever. It doesn't technically have to be a one-to-one -one ratio or a two-to-one ratio. There are various gears inside that they can um, kind of translate this uh, if necessary. Okay. And something else you should realize about grandfather clocks is they're not going to uh, work perfectly uh, because there is some air resistance. So they also have these hanging masses in here. Okay, so if anyone of you have ever had one of these before, you know you've got to um, adjust things in here. Um, sometimes you have to pull down a chain and it, it brings up the various masses and such. Uh, had a cuckoo clock like that. That was pretty fun. Um, okay, so let's um, let's look at our grandfather clock and say, oh, wait a minute, I noticed that my my time is a little bit off. Okay, I'm going to assume that all the mechanisms are that are inside are are working properly because heck, if I know how to fix one of these things, okay. But we're going to assume all the gears are correct and it it is 
translating correctly, but it's just not keeping accurate time. And we'll also assume we're on Earth, as I mentioned, if we're on a different planet, uh, or more specifically, with a different gravitational field, um, a smaller g, like on the Moon, would increase the period. So one second in reality would be different from one second ticked by on the clock. And then finally, let's assume that we're not invoking special relativity. And if you're curious about that, which is pretty cool, we can talk about that after the AP exam. So why does my clock run slow? Okay, the idea of it running slow is, as we said, um, the period and the length are related to each other. And the longer the length of the uh, pendulum, the longer the period. So if you have it set up so it takes one second to go back and forth, the clock interprets that as one second period. That means one second will tick by in the clock face. However, if for some reason it takes a little longer or a little shorter for the pendulum to swing back and forth, your clock is going to be running fast or slow. In the case of it running slow, Okay, that means the period is too big for its current settings. That is to say, it takes more than one second for this thing to swing back and forth, even though it's translating it as only one second. So what does that mean? If it takes more than one second, then that means it's going to be too long of a pendulum. Okay, you can fix that by shrinking it down. You say, oh man, I have to cut this pendulum up into pieces? No, actually this... The bob, you can just raise up a little bit. Okay, it wouldn't take much, but you can raise it up a little bit. You are effectively adjusting the center of mass of the pendulum bob. Okay, so you can just raise this up a little bit, and um, you, you would effectively get a shorter bob. All the, I'm sorry, a, a shorter pendulum. Okay, because instead of the center of mass being like, say, right here, it is raised up a little bit higher. Okay. So that's just kind of cool. And um, I was very curious about grandfather clocks. I was wondering, like, why do they call them grandfather clocks? And it, uh, according to a few random websites after a Google search, so who knows how terribly accurate it is, it's based on uh, people just referring to these as, oh, this was my grandfather's clock. And uh, then it kind of went from there. So it's not them being sexist because I actually have seen a picture of a grandmother clock. So I just thought that was very amusing. So physics. It's delicious, educational, and amusing. Yeah.